turns out that the Big Idea series is actually a big idea on its own. And it turns on this thought, and that is that when you put together two good but extremely different things, when you put those two things together, you make it something unexpected and surprising. And, you know, I'm thinking kind of examples in the cooking world. So, for example, maybe like mole sauce, you know, where you have a variety of different chili peppers mixed with chocolate, which you wouldn't normally expect. Maybe you put that on chicken and you end up with something that's kind of knock your socks off good and surprising. So our job tonight is to find the exquisite flavor in the combination of knowledge from two different parts of the world of science, from two radically different approaches to exploration. What could two such seemingly divergent areas of inquiry have in common? As we create a virtual Venn diagram of the evening in our minds, and that's something I know all of you do, <laughs> where will the overlaps lie? Adam's work has helped us to better understand the narrative of the universe, mapping its history and future by measuring its shape. Kenny's work has provided a chronicle of the Earth's history and a roadmap for better understanding current climate changes. We can ponder how their exploration of the unknown, whether it's the darkness of the universe or deep pockets within the Earth's, within the Earth's underground caves, and ask ourselves, how does this provide clarity both on our origins and the future of the cosmos. So one, one thing that I wanted to kind of start out with was it, in both of your work, there are and have been very significant moments of discovery. So, you know, like Kenny, you swim into one of those amazing kind of cathedral spaces. Or in your case, Adam, you know, you, you have this moment where you kind of like going, well, this calculation must be wrong, or. So describe a little bit about what it's like for the, that moment of discovery. And I'm, you know, what I'm fishing for is, is it going to be similar or different? Well, I'm going to jump in here and say, I think what's similar is I'm, I'm guessing that we're both scared at that moment. Um, Kenny's probably scared because he could die. <laughs> um, I'm just scared that I'll embarrass myself. and. Uh, because you know it's much easier. I mean, I see from my colleagues every day. People make mistakes all the time. You know, they run out of their office going, "Wow, something really weird's going on." Um, but most of the time, it's a bug or it's a mistake or a minus sign in the wrong place. And so, you're, uh, for me, I was just very afraid for many weeks and months as I kept analyzing this that uh, that I'd made a mistake and it would be a stupid mistake. Yeah. And how about you, Kenny? Yeah, it's a it's a strange combination actually of you'll. I'll get an aha moment by literally sticking your head into a muddy hole. You're not sure, but once you get into a cave and you realize the cave is going, that's the aha moment. But then comes very long periods of waiting, which I, I think you know when you see it come out in the popular press and even in you know peer-reviewed journals, that's usually after months, if not years, in years of whatever you found getting put through the ringer. Yeah. You know, still, still, I mean, pretty amazing moments. And I think the yeah. interesting thing is that time is a factor for both of you. And, and in fact, time is something that I think is really worth us talking about because you both operate in these kind of incomprehensible stretches of time. I mean, Adam, your stretches of time are just totally ridiculous. And, <laughs> and Kenny's, yours are also pretty ridiculous. But, but uh, talk a little bit about how you think about time and and also is time kind of on your side in terms of your research or is it working against you well one of the strange aspects of our research is um, the existence of dark energy the fact that the expansion is accelerating taken at face value if we don't end up learning something else about dark energy implies that eventually the universe will be expanding faster than the speed of light now uh, you may have heard nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. That's true. Nothing is traveling faster than the speed of light. It's actually space itself, the, the, the imaginary distance between two points, which is growing faster than the speed of light. That has real strange consequences, which is eventually we won't be able to see distant objects anymore. Um, the distant galaxies will essentially wink out because um, 
they will be moving away from us faster than the speed of light. Light will not be able to reach us from them. And so it'll get dark and dark and dark in sort of, if you can imagine concentric shells moving in until we can only see the very nearby uh, objects right around us. And so some people have even pointed out billions of years from now, um, cosmologists will not be able to discover what we discovered. So we'll have to leave some good notes. <laughs> right, and, and also there goes the job security. Right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I have a you know, more existential dilemma grappling with time. I mean, certainly when you look at the evolution of life, if we believe that uh, time scale that I put up, you realize uh, to a certain degree our insignificance of humans as a species. On the opposite end of the time spectrum, when I'm in a cave, you're keenly aware of every second that's passing because your time is intricately linked to the air in your tanks or whatever you're breathing sources, so every second feels, you're literally feeling time pass. And the two extremes, I mean, it, it puts you into this thought about, you know, the deepest thoughts about what life is and why we're here and will we last being here and how much we want to be here as a, you know, an individual and a species that wants to keep, keep surviving. But then you step back and you look at how, how fleeting our our lives are, our generations are in geologic time. I always yeah. find it but you're also, keeping me up at night. <laughs> just to jump in here, I'm, I'm uh, struck by one similarity uh, that I wouldn't have imagined, but um, the amount of time you could stay down there and investigate, as you say, is limited and the seconds are precious. We actually face the same sort of thing. The time on the Hubble Space Telescope is incredibly precious and mm -hmm. very difficult to obtain. There is only one Hubble Space Telescope all astronomers want to use it, it's oversubscribed by a factor of 10. So there's you know, 10 uh, experiments or projects we would like to do, or 10 years worth for every one year that's available. And so we schedule it down to the second, and so I may get allocated for the science project that I want to do, a certain amount of time that will be you know, um, allocated in seconds, and I very jealously look over the schedule of how to get the most out of those seconds. And, uh, I'm struck with how similar that is to the seconds you can spend in your environment. Right, and, and probably similarly, there's some places where you know you're only going to get to go there once. Mm. Shift gears a little bit. Um, one thing we were talking about earlier is this idea of um, how you kind of perceive your field or how you did and, and not accept the received wisdom uh, for you, Adam, you know, there was this kind of understood idea. You showed us the three, the, well, it's really the one, the crunch diagram. And that was the way to think. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, accepting or not accepting, pushing or not pushing, you know, um, being skeptical or not being skeptical, and what, what value that has, not just for science, but as explorers. I mean, I think whether it's genetic or I, I think there's a genetic trait among uh, certainly people who are into exploration and exploration related science that you're a natural skeptic. You don't believe what you see, so you push further. And it's certainly, that's why we were, we were talking before, it makes me laugh when you know, the scientific community is accused of making a concerted effort of some kind of hoax, whether it's climate change or something else. Our job, I get paid to rip apart my colleagues' papers. I mean, that's how you make a name for yourself just from a survival and ego standpoint. But also, I think it's what drives you is you don't take things at surface value. And it's a very tricky as a, you know, as a teacher to get students to, you want to teach them a certain set of information, then you want them to question that set of information. And it, it's a fine balance between telling them there is no truth, you got to go for it, you know, and except for Lot, unfortunately, I think a lot of academics do want students to do what they do, and I think that's a real, it's a shame when they put pressure that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think of this example of Einstein I was talking about before, where, okay, he had one idea about the universe, and it was wrong, and he was willing to accept that and move on to the next thing, and then, you know, he had made an important discovery. He didn't even know that was an important discovery. We discovered everybody else was wrong, that that actually was important. And so this is, I mean, we're just so used to this as the process of science. I mean, it's not, it's not like somebody handing us a, a, a sacred tome and saying, these are the rules of the universe, you know, you will obey them. But rather, you know, we are figuring out 
the rules of the universe. And uh, you know, our only guidepost is this process of science, where we're going to do an observation, we're going to make a measurement, we're going to see what it shows. We're not going to take anything for granted, because that's the system that has taught us. You know, go back to Galileo when everybody thought uh, you know, all the bodies went around the Earth. And he you know, put that telescope up and showed uh, you know, his contemporary leaders uh, the moons are going around Jupiter, and that's, I mean, you know, we, we have bought into this process of discovery by seeing and doing and not accepting, and so it's, it works remarkably well, and, I, you know, we just believe that that's the way to continue. I, I mean, unfortunately, my uh, five-year-old and nine-year-old have adopted that skepticism <laughs> <laughs> with everything I say. <laughs> it's time for bedtime, well, based on what theory, Dad? <laughs> Uh, really, it's, it's getting a little annoying. Yeah. So I, I think we ought to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. I'm sure the typical geographic audience is uh, pulsing with um, brilliant questions. So there are microphones circulating. And let's, this first one right on the aisle here. I, I would like to ask Adam if you could take a moment, for those of us who do not know a great deal about astronomy, and explain what happened with the Big Bang, and what was before? I wasn't the there, Big by the way. <laughs> I, I understand that. This is speculation. Um, sorry, what happened with the Big Bang and what there was before? Yes. Um, so the Big Bang is a little bit of a misnomer in that you know people tend to think of it, they get the wrong picture probably from TV or movies, that there's an explosion somewhere in space. Um, and uh, really, the Big Bang uh, is really a Big Bang theory, and it's the fact that we see, as we look back in time, as we look out to look back in time, we see everything was closer together, everything was hotter, uh, everything was younger. And so it is very natural to form this theory that everything is moving out. You know, it was actually given this uh, statement like a Big Bang as a ridiculed statement. Um, by uh, the, the leading opponent of the theory of a Big Bang, uh, Fred Hoyle, who believed in, in the 1950s, an alternative called the steady state theory. He was, so he said, oh, what do you think? The universe just started in some Big Bang? People were like, pretty, pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> because all the, all the evidence is there of exactly what would happen. And so we have an understanding of when that process occurred. It was about 13.7 billion years ago. How do we know that? Well. I told you we know how fast the universe is expanding, and so it isn't hard to sort of run that movie backwards in time. Instead of expanding, imagine the universe contracting at that same rate. How long ago was everything back at a single point 13.7 billion years ago? As to what occurred before then, we really don't know. I mean, we really, I mean, it may not even be possible to know. It may be that the universe uh, sort of, you know, is created at that moment as a quantum fluctuation. Um, it may be that whatever occurred before, there's no record of it that transmits forward. You know, um, somebody once asked me, you know, what is it that you'd want to transmit forward? We think that our universe can be described by six numbers now. That's our current thinking on the cosmological model. You'd almost want to write down those six numbers on a fortune cookie and pass it through, you know, that big bang moment, you know, this was us and, you know, before the next universe starts. But uh, we really don't know about that earlier moment. Um, we just, we have a very good empirical understanding of the evolution of our universe since that point in time when it was all at a point. Mm -hmm. Here, right here in the middle. Hi. So you'll have to forgive me for being the devil's advocate on this. Um, my question to both of you is, why does it matter? Um, why does knowing that the universe is expanding matter? And why does it matter if we discover a species that went extinct two million years ago? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, but let, let me go to the general question, why go into an underwater cave? In pretty much we can't send remote operated vehicles or use ground penetrating radar to get a sense of where, what's going on with our water sources beneath our feet in many parts of the world. So it's very practical, selfish. I want to know where our water is so we know where to put or not put a dairy or a chemical plant or a dump or something like that. So you know, human health, survival from water. The new species, if I want to put it in a, a not just knowledge for knowledge sake, but in a, a selfish framework is you know, a lot of our pharmaceuticals, metal, medical advances come from life, life forms, extremophiles, microbes, and other, you know, 
uh, sponges, for example, some uh, algae related to corals, things like that. So, you know, from a, uh, whether you look at it as a business um, breakthrough, why, I mean, why do we want to make medicines? Why do we want people to live longer if we have too many people on the earth? I mean, those are, those are things that you can answer for me. But I mean, there are some very practical reasons, but certainly to make policy decisions uh, related to natural, natural resource management, I think is one answer I can give. Um, in my case, I would say that uh, nature hides the laws of physics in difficult to reach places, extremes of energy or space. And so um, if we want to understand the laws of physics, we often have to look at the universe as the laboratory that we can't build here. And so that's how we learn. Um, now, learning about the laws of physics has always uh, led to, has always been a central engine of technology. I mean, whether it was, you know, quantum mechanics in the 1930s uh, led to lasers and semiconductors and transistors. Um, you know, I talked about Einstein and his theory of gravity. Well, uh, general relativity is uh, baked into, uh, any of you use a GPS um, to figure out your position, you'd be off by many kilometers each day from your location. If we want to uh, locate uh, positions on a planet, use cell phones, use mapping technology. Um, I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, all of the modern technology we have comes from a deeper understanding of laws of physics. Now, uh, I would be the first to admit, it isn't the kind of research that leads to you know, the iPhone 7. I mean, it won't be out, you know, <laughs> next, next year or the quarter after that. Um, this is basic research. It's long term, but it's, it's been the biggest payoff because, you know, the research you do for the iPhone 7, you know, doesn't revolutionize your ability to uh, identify where you are, uh, you know, as a random spot on a planet and things like that. So, you know, it, it definitely has practical applications. Um, but you know Einstein would have been shocked that the uh, about the GPS satellite system. So, but there, isn't there also a practical? There's another practical side. Uh, you know, Kenny, in your case, you're telling us about the history of the planet, and like a lot of social sciences, you know, we learn from the past so that we can know the future. In terms of climate, uh, there's an interesting record there. Maybe it's not predictable. No, that's that's right. Certainly, I mean the there's. The samples we're getting from the dust and the uh, speleothems, the stalagmites, will directly impact how we go about, you know, changing our climate models, which has implications for our ability to plan for the, the future, which is a you know very uncertain future in many ways. While we know climate change is happening, we don't have a great sense of what regional changes will be and the time scales that things may occur and you know the sensitivity of the climate system. So anything that helps us record variability of the past is a step toward better understanding the future. Well, you know, I, I know that we could go and go and go, but... Um, Infinitely. But, but yes, that's right. <laughs> if space is. Yeah. It's accelerating, too. And, um, <laughs> But I want to. I, I just want to thank both of you so much, and thank the audience for a fantastic, yeah, thank you all. fantastic evening. Yeah.